My, my name is Baudouin de Guilbon, a typical French name. Sorry for this. Um, Marc Rivière earlier sp spoke much better than I speak English, really. So you, you will have to support my English, my bad English for a couple of, couple of minutes. And I will then uh, introduce Jake Memory, who will do the follow-up with our product owner for Signal. And we also have remotely Charles Engian, who is our CTO, who will demo and present uh, the S1000D for windshield solution that has been built originally by PTC and that, that we have taken over a couple of years ago. Sorry, I forgot to introduce Kate Hawkins, who is in charge of the, the, the signal business unit, which is just in front of the desk. Hello, I'm Kate. I'm not presenting today, um, but I work with these guys and Charles, who's in the States and will be remote. So, uh, next, next slide. So GPSL stands for Global Publishing Solution Limited. We are a professional software and solution provider and a, a PTC partner since 20, uh, 2006. In the, and we have a long history in aerospace and defense. We also partner with uh, Informatic uh, since I, I believe you made the introduction I, I couldn't understand, but I, I believe you, you could make the introduction of our relationship that we have since almost a year now as, a, as partner and reseller from GPSL in Turkey. Uh, so GPSL is a professional software and solution provider. Uh, we have uh, offices, our main office is in the UK. And we also have offices in the US, in Australia, in India, and in France. Um, most of our customers are with us since more than 10 years. So we, we, we have quite big relationships with our customers. And sorry, I forgot to click. Uh, so our um, aerospace and defense customer, I will speak about, uh, about them in, in a couple of seconds. We offer integrated solution for mission critical content challenges that have our customers in the AMD. AMD represents probably more than 50% of, of our business. We're in also other parts, but with the PTC, we are focusing with uh, aerospace and defense. Even if we are small, uh, we are probably a 60, 60 people company. Uh, as I mentioned, we have offices in different parts of the, the, the, the world. And we have uh, significant customers. Most of them were presented either by you or by, by PTC, uh, which are Leonardo, BAE System, MBDA in France, Safran as well, Lockheed Martin, uh, Northrop, Grumman, General Atomics and U.S. Navy. I believe you had a good presentation from uh, Marc, Marc Rivière uh, earlier. So this is a brief introduction about GPSL. I will now leave it to Jake, who will um, have the charge of uh, presenting the signal, signal suite and, and what, what S1000D is about. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jake Memory. I'm the Signal S1000D product manager. I'm going to do my best to keep my pace very slow. I've already been asked by Serdar. I do tend to talk quite fast, but I will do my best to keep it at a, uh, a reasonable pace. Um, I've been working uh, with, in aerospace and defense for around 25 years um, and a practitioner of S1000D for about 20 of those years. Um, over that period of time with a number of global aerospace companies um, and what I have learned in that time using the software that is available to us 
is that typically speaking, the software is not particularly intuitive. It's a steep learning curve to begin with the specification S1000D. It's not an easy specification. So over the last four or five years, I have set out on the ambitious task of trying to build more user-friendly, more accessible software. So what have I learned in that time? Well, I learned to code, and I learned that I can't code. So I handed that off to somebody else straight away. But what I did learn is that I do seem to be able to uh, design products quite well, and one of which we will have a look at later. Um, so we're going to be talking about S1000D specification, but obviously the fundamental question before we do any of that is, what is S1000D? So S1000D is an international specification used the world over. So it defines how we produce technical manuals for our products. Oops, I'm sorry how we produce technical manuals for our products. Products typically being very complex, uh, and it provides us a framework by which to, um, to produce and manage that complex data. S1000D is based on XML markup language, and XML is non-proprietary. So there are numerous companies that produce software, that, you, you know, that, that, that supply software that you can produce S1000D in. And in theory, any one of those pieces of software should be able to produce export S1000D that you can import into another piece of software. That's one of the fundamental reasons behind it, is the data exchange piece. S1000D is, fund is fundamentally based around the data module concept, and data modules are small chunks of data which can be reused across different publications within your, you know, within your product data set. Um, so, you know, a small chunk of information could be a description, a procedure, uh, an operating instruction relating to uh, a system, a subsystem, or, you know, a component. And we can reuse those pieces of data interreferencing one another, ensuring that there is this single point of truth, and there's that single point of truth um, phrase again that we heard from Mark earlier. So there's a lot of interreferencing that happens within the data set to make sure that we retain this single point of truth. So where did S1000D come from? Well, this slide gives us you know, an idea of the evolution of the timeline by which S1000D came into, uh, into play. So back in the 50s, 1956, we had ATA100, which was, uh, you know, essentially gave us the, the concept of breaking down a product, an aircraft in this case, into, uh, into systems and subsystems and sub-subsystems, et cetera, and giving that structure a, uh, you know, a standard number. Then in the 80s came the first iteration of the S1000D specification, uh, which adopted the ATA numbering system, so we still use that ATA numbering system today. And then moving forward, we've got the S series, which again we heard Mark touch on earlier, and we, we will you know, we'll touch a bit more on shortly, although this is more about S1000D than the wider S series. So just to touch on those other S series available to us, uh, this slide shows us some of those integrations. So S1000D can live independently of all of these, and often does. But as Mark touched on earlier, there are these other S-series specifications that are becoming more widespread um, within industry. And the idea of this, of course, is that we're reusing data, in, you know, enhancing that digital thread concept. We're reusing the LSA data, pushing that into our tech pubs, training information, preventive maintenance information, and of course, our material management information. So why do we use S1000D? Well, there's numerous reasons why we'd want to use S1000D, but the data reuse piece is the big one. The very concept of the data module encourages the data reuse principle and even eliminates the duplication of data. The ability to publish to multi-channels from the same source is another big one. So, you know, quite often we still need to produce a PDF for the end user. But more often than not these days, you know, uh, something more uh, electronic, some electronic-based um, uh, publication is also desirable too, and we can do that from the same source information. <coughs> Decreased costs. Well, this one can be a little bit contentious because 
typically S1000D implementation is quite expensive. You know, it's expensive to get the software, the training, to get up and running, to get your data converted. But typically, over time, the cost savings are tangible and they can be realized if, if, if done properly. Interoperability, which is a word I struggle with. I'm impressed I did it. So, more often than not, we're not producing every part of our product, whether it be an aircraft, a tank, you know, whatever it is. We have a supply chain around us and we have partners. So, the interoperability means that the data is in exactly the same format, no matter who is producing that data. Um, and we can exchange data between companies and import and export from systems. So it's that, um, that collaboration enhances that collaboration effort. So as a company, what do GPSL offer to enable you to work with S1000D? Well, the next piece of this presentation, I'm going to be handing over to Charles, who is, uh, by the wonders of technology, on Teams, and I'm hoping this is going to work fairly fluidly. Uh, Charles is our CTO. Um, and assuming you can hear me, Charles, it's over to you for this next piece. Hi, Jake. Hi, everyone. My name is Charles Sanjohn. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's good to, to talk with everyone today. Um, as Jake said, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for GPSL. Uh, I started my career in logistics. So I actually started uh, as a technical author and writing uh, illustrated parts catalogs. So very familiar with the software, both from the using end as, as well as the development end, um, and had been an active practitioner of um, the PTC product line for a very long time, as well as SGML and XML. So if you could go to the next slide for me, Jake. Okay, we're going to talk here generically about what it takes to implement an S1000D solution. And no matter what the solution is, we really tend to break it down into three different um, major components. The create component, the management of that information, and then the delivery of that information. So no matter, no matter what S1000D solution you're looking at, there really are those three uh, components, create, manage, and deliver. So on the create side, you at a minimum need an illustration tool uh, for being able to bring in your 2D and 3D uh, illustration information, hopefully from CAD information that's already been developed, um, but it can also be done from scratch. And some type of XML editor um, that allows you to uh, create the um, information that you need in accordance with the S1000D issue that you're uh, choosing for your particular project. Um, so on the managed side, the managed side is, I think, one of the things that sets S1000D apart from a lot of different specifications. S1000D has a very specific set of uh, instructions about how information, data modules, like Jake mentioned, should be managed uh, over time. And it has to do with this S1000D CSDB, also known as a common source database. And what you're going to see is that you would have a very hard time um, managing all of your technical information on something like a file system based on the workflows and life cycles that this content needs to be able to go through. Remember that S1000D tends to be used on products that are very long life cycle something that can be in the field for 10 or 20 years. So the information that supports those products needs to be available for 10 or 20 years. It's part of the reason for the need for interoperability. It's part of the reason that you need to be able to manage that information uh, over a long time period. And then finally, we need to be able to deliver that information somehow, usually as, as PDF or some sort of electronic delivery. So you need some sort of transformation engine that takes that XML data modules, assembles them into some sort of uh, logical order for someone to be able to consume as either a PDF or as an electronic technical publication. So if you go to the next slide for me, Jake. 
Okay. GPSL has two distinct solutions for S1000D. Um, the first one is the S1000D for PTC windshield. If you are a windshield customer and you are starting with product lifecycle management and running through the entire digital thread, the S1000D for PTC windshield solution makes sense because it extends that product lifecycle management thread all the way through service lifecycle all the way to delivery. So we use a series of PTC products uh, that help us be able to create that content. We manage all of the S1000D content in a CSDB that we put on top of PTC windshield, and then we deliver it through the Arbortex publishing engine and uh, various interactive electronic technical publications. The S1000D for PTC windshield solution supports uh, issues of the S1000D sp specification all the way from issues 2.3 to the latest version 5.0. So it has a wide um, uh, flexibility in what issue type you pick. In aerospace and defense, issues 4.1 and 4.2 are fairly common these days. Uh, if you have legacy programs, they may be on issues 2.3 or 3.0. Programs that are, are adopting S1000D typically pick an issue and tend to stay on it. They don't increment as the, the S1000D specification evolves. So if you start your program on issue 4.2, most likely you'll stay with issue 4.2 throughout the life cycle of that, that program. Um, if you are not using PTC Windchill and you are um, new to S1000D and need to be able to deliver content um, for other solutions that are not uh, using the rest of the, the, the digital lifecycle thread, the Signal product gives you an easy way and an introduction to uh, being able to deliver S1000D content without the burdens of installing um, tooling or CSDBs. So it is a completely software as a service based solution that allows you to basically be up and running quickly. And I'll let Jake talk more about that as, as he demos Signal after I talk about Windchill. But um, the, the two products are designed for different markets depending on um, where you're starting. So if you're starting with CAD PLM and that PLM is, is from PTC Windchill, the S1000D for PTC Windchill solution is, is the, the right solution. If you're starting with a need to deliver S1000D content, um, but you don't necessarily have the CAD or PLM data behind that, the signal for S1000D suite will give you a, a start in that, in that uh, ability to deliver S1000D without uh, the complete digital threat. So if you can go to the next slide for me, Jake. Okay. So I'm going to walk through just sort of the high-level parts of the GPSL S1000D for PTC Windchill solution. Um, and we can go to the next slide here. Okay, so we're going to put the end-to-end -end digital thread sort of in the context of all of the different uh, components that make up this solution. So if you would uh, hit the, the space bar for me. The first portion of this is the create column, and there's three different products that we tend to use in this space. Arbortext Editor Styler is the XML authoring component to this. The styling component allows us to develop style sheets for that S1000D content to modify its look and feel. Um, Arbortext IsoDraw is a way of being able to develop 2D uh, illustration content from scratch. Uh, it allows you to to author illustrations and isometric views. Creo Illustrate is another authoring tool that's available from PTC that allows you to not only do the 2D uh, illustration component, but also to import your 3D CAD uh, information to create isometric views of that uh, and be able to illustrate them with callouts and, and part information. Creo Illustrate is connected directly to PTC Windchill, so you can get your CAD information, pull it in, keep it up to date as you're creating your illustrations. 
Next. Next portion of this is the manage aspect of that, and that's handled inside of, of PTC Windchill. Um, on top of PTC Windchill, GPSL has several solutions, one of them being the S1000D for PTC Windchill solution. We also have other military specification um, applications that sit on top of PTC Windchill. For example, the US Army uses an application called 40,051. Uh, and we've built applications on top of Windchill for that as well. Next. The publish component uses the Arbitex publishing engine. This is a publishing engine that is designed for our high volumes of, of content and transactional data. It allows us to assemble all of the different uh, data modules that have been created and managed within PTC Windchill and assemble them into a manual for either electronic or PDF delivery. Next. For delivery, uh, GPSL has a interactive electronic technical publication called Viewpoint uh, that allows us to deliver things in an HTML5 compliant web browser. Um, you will also support other uh, interactive electronic technical publications. So. If you're an S1000D viewer, basically any S1000D viewer should be able to accept uh, an S1000D uh, delivery package. And then finally, to complete the life cycle, we have this transformation component where we're taking and maintaining the CAD information that is available from the parts lifecycle management part of the project and making sure that that is staying up to date with what is being um, authored, created, and maintained. So, you know, we always talk uh, in, in authoring terms really about sort of some of the initial content creation. But like I said, the, the content's going to be in the field for 10 or 20 years and will need to be able to be continually revised. So this is not a one cycle for each data module. It's multiple cycles for each data module and being able to keep that information up to date, knowing what information has changed downstream um, from you is an important concept. So that's part of the reason we show this as a complete life cycle that is in a continuous flow. So if you can go to the next slide for me, Jake. Okay, like I said, the, the CSDB is, is really sort of the heart of the S1000D solution and it sits on top of PTC Windchill for this first solution. And what that's allowing us to do is to control a lot of uh, the metadata and the management of the information that you're creating. So life cycles and versions and workflow would be one of the first things that the CSDB is, is providing. What state is the information that you're creating in? Is it in work? Has it been reviewed? Uh, has it been approved? Has it been sent to a customer before? These are all lifecycle states that are available within, within S1000D. Same thing for version control. How has this data module evolved over a period of time? Um, has it been checked in and out multiple times in the authoring process? Has it been revised at some point so that it's been reissued to a customer? And how do I get that data module between my authoring community my editing community, and my subject matter experts. So being able to manage uh, all of the, the workflow around being able to create, manage, and review that data module is also an important uh, concept within the CSDB. The CSDB also has these concepts of information and publication structures. We're going to talk more about them uh, in the next several slides. But the information structure allows you to save your data module information in cabinets. And if you're familiar with engineering terms, it's the equivalent of an engineering filing cabinet. So just like you would store your component information, your drawings, your parts lists for a particular component in a specific folder within your, your engineering uh, breakdown of that uh, component, you can also now store the logistics information and technical information that goes along with that as well. Public stri publication structures can be completely different and that can be assembling the data modules in some form that makes sense for delivery. 
we're inf we're managing all the different types of information that could be required for a uh, for a solution. So the data modules what we talked about, the publication modules, and the illustrations. That's one of the things the CSDB is managing. We're filtering that information depending on whether or not it's applicable to our particular product. In aerospace and defense, we tend to now make a lot of different um, iterations and combinations of products. So you may have a single vehicle that has seven different uh, variants to it. So is all the information different for those seven different types of vehicles? No, there's a lot of it that's common, but there's also a lot of it that is specific to whether or not that vehicle is being used as a troop carrier or it's being used as an ambulance or it's being used for cargo. So being able to define what is common, being able to define what is different is an important aspect of what the CSDB controls. It allows us to mix that information together and then uh, filter based on what specific product you're working with on that particular day. Other functions of the CSDB is that it manages the delivery of that information. It manages the delivery to what has potentially become multiple customers. It manages the business rules that everyone in the S1000D uh, project have agreed to start by. S1000D has a lot of flexibility and part of that flexibility is being able to provide uh, an enforcement for agreements that are made at the start of a project. So um, there's a above and beyond the, the, the templates that are provided for S1000D. There's a series of business rules that need to be enforced uh, in the data as well. And the CSDB helped manage that. Next. Okay. So this is the CSDB inside of PTC's windshield. Um, if you notice on the left-hand side, there is a series of projects and you see an S1000D 5.0 bike data project, an S1000D 4.1 bike data project. You even see some 40,051 content. One of the powers of the solution is this ability to manage not only a single uh, issue of S1000D, but multiple issues of S1000D for potentially different projects and programs. So if you could hit the play button there for me, Jake. It's playing, Charles. So we're going to go, yep, thank you. Uh, so it's, we're going to go take a look in the S1000D 5.0 bike data project. And we're going to first take a look at an information structure. The information structure represents what is the standard numbering system that we've been talking about to help break down a product. So if we go take a look in the brake system, we're going to drill down to the component of the mountain bike here that has uh, information associated with it. And you see how many times it's been issued. You see if it's been in work. You see the status of those different data modules uh, within the CSDB. So all of this content has currently been issued at some point um, to a client in the past based on what we're seeing in that, in that CSDB structure. The data module code is unique. It's a unique identifier for that particular piece of information. So it represents both the system, subsystem, what type of information it is, um, and any variants of that information that are, are applicable. So if you can go to the next slide for me there, Jake. Okay, this next section we're gonna talk about um, actually authoring a, a particular um, piece of data. I think you need to hit next there for me again. Thanks. Okay, so we're now at this place within the, the bikes lighting data section where we're gonna actually add a new document. So we're gonna say insert a new document and we're gonna select what language the authoring language is. 
we're going to select what template or information we're going to create. In this case, it will be descriptive information. And then we're going to select the information code or what type of information we're going to be talking about. And in this case, we're going to be talking about the different materials that are going to be used, mixture and solutions. Notice how the, the template is being filled out for us so that a lot of the information for the standard numbering system has been filled out, who the information was originated from, um, whether it's classified or not. We now have a brand new data module and you see that its life cycle state is in pending and that it's brand new. So the first thing we need to do is we need to assign this to an author and a reviewer so that we can send it um, to be actually authored. So we're going to assign it to an author and we can select any of the authors that have been uh, assigned to this particular project. BTC Winchell allows you to co connect to your Active Directory system, so you're not having to re-enter all of your authors and reviewers. It's basically connected to the rest of your enterprise systems. So we've assigned an author. We'll now also assign a reviewer to this particular data module so that when the author is done, they can send it directly to the reviewer for either approval or for comments and suggestions about what the author needs to be able to change. All right, so now we have an author and a reviewer for the system. Our final job as the product manager is to send it on its merry way. And so we're going to release that for authoring. Yeah. At this point, you notice how the lifecycle state changed to pending, and now it's work in progress. So the work in progress state means that this has been sent to be worked by an author and a reviewer until it's completed. So the work in progress state means that there has been an email that's been sent to the author that we just allocated that says, hey, there's a new task for you uh, that we need you to work on, and uh, here's the data module that you should fill out. All right, so that's the first part of creating a new data module within the content, uh, the CSDB. So if you select the next slide for me. Okay, we're gonna now transition from the PTC Winchell CSDB to Arbor Text Editor, the authoring interface. Uh, the Arbor Text Editor interface has been around for a significant uh, number of years. It is arguably one of the most powerful XML editors on the planet. It has the ability to handle both large documents as well as different specifications um, that you may, be, you may be dealing with. It has um, the different wizards and things that we've built into it to make S1000D easier. For example, being able to um, tag illustrations so that you can create hotspots between the illustration and the content. It has a lot of familiar word processing capabilities, so control B would still give you bold, control I would give you italic, um, symbols, things that you would be familiar with in Microsoft Word. Uh, it has real-time validation so that it's staying true to the specification that, um, uh, that you've selected. And our philosophy in creating the S1000D application for this has been that the author should be able to spend all of their time in Arbor Text Editor and be able to receive their tasks there. So if you go to the next slide for me, Jake. So Arbor Text Editor, and you can hit play for that. So Arbor Text Editor, when it comes up, uh, has a set of, of toolbars on it that are fairly familiar. Um, like I said, it has 
good table handling. It has symbol handling. Um, it has uh, search capabilities, undo, redo, things like you would find in, in Microsoft Word. Um, it also has the ability to connect to PTC's Windshield product. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually connect Arbor Text Editor to PTC Windchill. <clears throat> and in doing that, we'll be able to connect to our CSDB. So we'll be able to connect to our Bike 5.0 project that we've been working in. And once we connect to the 5.0 bike project or our CSDB, you're going to see an additional menu that's added, which is that S1000D menu, because it knows we're dealing with an S1000D project. And we have a task dialog box that allows authors to receive any tasks that have been assigned to them directly from Arbor Text Editor. So I can filter down to particular tasks for particular models, for example. I can see that one of the tasks has been assigned to me for this lighting mixture and solution. So I can um, check that content out into Arbor Text Editor, and what it's going to bring up is the S1000D template um, for the thing that I need to author. So in this case, it's bringing up the lights, mixture, and solutions template for uh, the authoring. It's filled out any of the information that it has. You're able to view that content both with the XML tags on as well as off. Um, and then it allows you to author the descriptive information after the metadata section. So if that's going to follow the template that is pre-selected and part of the S1000D specification. So for example, I can add a paragraph and some simple content. Um, I think one of the hardest things about Arbor Text Editor is that when you hit the Enter key, you get that list of um, elements that are available to you, not necessarily a, a new line. Once you get past that, it's fairly intuitive about um, being able to figure out what order uh, the content needs to be, to be placed in. Has spelling capabilities built in, just like you would expect in, in Arbor Text Editor. So we'll just put in some simple content for the day. At that point, when we're done authoring, also from that task dialog box, I'm able to validate the content to make sure that I haven't violated any of the um, business rules that are uh, applicable for that content. So when I complete my task, it's going to do a scan of that document for me make sure that I've completed everything that needs to be completed, and then also check it against any business rules that are, are part of this particular project. We see that there are no completeness errors at this point, so it's ready to go. And when I select OK here, it's going to change the, the lifecycle state of this, and it's going to send the reviewer that we selected an email that says this content is, is ready for review. So if you could advance uh, the slide for me, Jake. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've actually got some content in the um, CSDB, we need to assemble that content into a technical manual. And the Arbor Text Publishing Engine is going to help us do that along with publication structures. So we've covered create, we've covered manage, we're now going to cover deliver. And one of the first things we need to be able to do is create a publication structure so that we can assemble all of the data modules we've authored uh, to be able to transform them in the right order into a PDF. So if we select next, please. Hit play. Okay, just like we looked at the information structures where we actually store all of the data modules in some sort of logical order, there are publication structures within the CSDB as well. So when we select the publication structure, we're going to be able to create a new publication outline directly within 
ETCs will show. We don't have any currently, so we're going to create a new one. Again, we'll select what authoring language we're working in. We will uh, give it a title and a name. What its target issue date is. We'll do this as an operations and maintenance publication. Give it a publication number. And we'll hit finish. What that's going to create is it's going to create a blank publication for us. Okay, well if we go into the publication structure now, what we can do is from the structures tab, we can start to assemble the publication based on all of the data modules that we currently have. It also allows us to insert things like tables of contents that we would need, indexes, um, different section titles, so that we can build up something that would resemble the book. So we can insert a section call that section uh, materials needed. Okay. And now if we go over to the standard numbering system or the information structure, we can go and we can drill down into the lighting component. We can go find that data module that we just authored. And we can drag that into the section that we just created for materials needed. And it's a hierarchy structure, so I can drag that where it's needed within the, the publication. I can add any other data modules that I need, and I can build up my book that way. So once I'm done building up the book, I can go over to this representations tab and I can actually call the publishing engine. I can tell it to render that publication structure for me so that I can see what it would look like in PDF. So I'm going to select what style sheet that I want to be able to use. I'm going to submit that publishing job and the publishing engine is going to go work on that data. It works on it in a queue format so I can um, view the contents and see what Part of the queue it's in. When it's completed, it will also show up in this representations tab, and I can then view my PDF. There we go. We have an operations and maintenance manual for the particular bike that uh, we've been working through. Very good. And if you can. Um, Go to the next slide for me. And with that, I would hand it back to you, Jake. Thank you very much, Charles. Okay. So we've talked about what S1000D is, and we've seen uh, one of our S1000D solutions and how that can be integrated with a PLM system to establish a digital thread where one system passes data to the next to help us populate our technical publications. But what if we've got somewhat simpler requirements? What if we just need to create user documentation without integrations from other systems or without needing an understanding of S1000D at all or XML for that matter? And what if we don't have windshield, more to the point? So what if we just want to create a better, more structured approach to technical publications than the traditional you know, word-based approach? Well, we've also got a solution for that. But before we jump into a demo, um, 
what is Signal and why do we build it? So S1000E isn't simple, as we've already established. It's a three and a half thousand page document, uh, which is not an easy read, take it from me. Um, the document itself doesn't really, it, it, it's a steep learning curve, whichever way you look at it. The document itself will give you guidance on how to implement it and how to use it, but you would need training, um, and that's before you get to the tools, which as I say, often don't help the situation. So we built a, a Signal from the ground up to simplify the journey from zero to S1000E, enabling any company of any size um, to better take advantage of the specification without the usual complexities of installation and training and all the other complications that come with uh, S1000E adoption. So we've done that using modern web technologies. As Charles already mentioned, the Signal product is predominantly a SaaS product and it can be accessed via a web browser with nothing installed locally. So let's take a look at that. So this will be the last section of the day. I might need some help switching the screen over here. I just need to share my browser, please. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Oh, nope. So what we're looking at is the login screen for our Signal S1000E suite. As I say, there's nothing installed locally, so we're accessing this via our browser. So I'll be logging in today using a kind of generic uh, environment called My Company, but with each tenant, each customer, you get your own unique uh, URL and your own unique environment that you can brand accordingly. So I'll log in as me into this account. if my PC recognizes me. There we go. And uh, we've just got a two-factor authentication step to go through, so this should send me a code to my phone any second. Okay. And the first thing that we notice when we log into the system is this pretty dashboard interface. Now, the dashboard gives us various statistics about the data within our projects uh, or the currently selected project. So, for example, the currently selected project is shown up here, but the data uh, available to us is to do with the various projects within the system and the currently selected project. So this widget here, for example, is showing us the users within the currently selected project and what data they have got allocated to them, checked in and checked out, etc. So there's numerous widgets that we can, uh, that we can play with in here. Um, and this interface is completely customizable as well, as is most of the system. So before we look at some of the functions, let's just get familiar with the, uh, the user interface. So if I come down to the left and go to the administrator menu item, uh, we've got some system settings at the bottom here. Now, these are settings relating to the entire environment, and we're not particularly interested in those right now. The S1000D configurations is where we set up our system specifically for our projects. So it's where we contain the metadata that we use in all the data modules. So, for example, country codes, cage codes, um, security codes, and that kind of information is all is all um, configured in these menus. So I've just gone on to language codes, for example, and you can see that I've got some languages in here. Uh, the same with um, cage codes. Because S1000D will make use of these repositories shortly when we create data modules. If we come up to the users tab, this is where the users are added to the system. And we're not assigning users at this point to any specific project. We're assigning them any kind of 
privileges or rights, this is where we're just adding them to the system. Creating new users is really simple. Fill in a few credentials and the system will email you those details or email the user those details. Roles is really powerful within this system. So roles are just collections of permissions. So for example, if we go to the author role and we go to edit and to permissions, we can see a bunch of checkboxes which represent different permissions and different functions and features within the system available to us. So the roles are completely customizable depending on your admin or your, you know, your company. Um, and in addition to that, you can get really creative and create your own roles. So this particular role here, you can see, for example, has been given access to the dashboard. But as an admin or as a, you know, a, a super user, I may want, not want my authors to access the, the dashboard and see that, those statistics. So we can turn that off. But obviously, we do want the authors to be able to check in and check out and edit data modules. So of course, they're checked. Anything that isn't checked, when a user logs in as that role, those menus will not be available to them. They won't be grayed out. They just won't be visible. Again. Um, going back to making the, the system as simp simple as possible and easy to learn as possible. But as I said, you can create custom roles. So you could get really creative in here. You may well, for example, have a lead author, which we may want to assign some additional permissions to. So we can do that in here. One of the other things we can do, you might notice here we've got these external tags that are next to the customer and supplier roles. So these are two custom roles that I've set up. And what this external tag means is it means that if I assign a user either as a customer or a supplier on a specific project, when that, that user logs in, they won't be able to see the entire project data, only specific data modules that have been assigned to them. So further restricting the visibility for external users. So the system at this point becomes you know, a proper collaboration environment. We can actually invite customers, suppliers into the system and have them creating data, or in the customer's case, validating data that we've written. So let's come to project list. So this is a list of the projects within my environment. And this is the currently selected one, as you can see. If we come up to create new project, we have to fill in a few details here, give the project a name, a model identification code. We fill in a few specification details, and this is where we're going to start picking from those repositories that we saw earlier. So for example, if I click security class, these are the available security classes available to me. The same with language codes, and so on. Same with the cage codes. So these are all pieces of information that we need for our data module. So our project needs to know what our default values are. It will also create a BREX data module for us. And I think Mark touched on this earlier. That's a business rules uh, exchange, the BREX. It's, you know, it's where we contain our computer readable business rules. So when we check in and check out data, or sorry, check in data modules, um, we can ensure that those data modules comply with the business rules. At a project level, when we're setting a project up, we can also choose what kind of workflow the data modules will go through to validate uh, that data. So by default, we've got a very, very simple workflow. The author would author the data module. It would then go to the reviewer, and the reviewer would approve or reject that data. But that's a fairly simple workflow, and in most cases, we might want to be a bit more advanced than that, a bit more, a bit, apply a bit more scrutiny. So what we can do is we can select custom workflow, and what that does is expose the roles that we saw earlier, including any custom roles. So I could say, well, okay, I still want a, oops, I still want a reviewer to review my data after the author. And then perhaps I want maybe a safety engineer, if, I, if I'd set up a safety engineer, or quality, or engineering, or in this case, maybe a customer. So the customer could have final sign-off of that data. So again, you can be incredibly creative around how you want your workflow process to be. We also pick our standard numbering system, and finally labels. So just to touch on labels, if I go into our currently selected project, this opens up the same dialog, but you can see in my project that I previously set up, I've pre-configured a bunch of labels. So labels essentially allow us to tag data modules with any, um, 
any specific tags or any specific labels that the admin has set up. So in this case, you can see that we've got one for awaiting graphics, for example, on hold, not required. And again, we can be as creative as we like. And that enables authors or anybody else to tag specific data modules with specific tags and later report or filter on those tags. Okay, so project users is where we allocate the users to the specific project and assign them a specific role. So you can see there's a bunch of users here for this particular project and you can see the roles that they have been allocated down the side here. If we wanted to add another user, of course, I'd go over to add user, tick the box and then assign them a role. So whenever we do anything new or we're creating anything or changing anything in this system, it's usually just a button click away over here. Again, we've tried to design the system so you don't need to be familiar necessarily with S1000D or need advanced training. It's all fairly intuitive. So let's come down to the data module manager. So this is where users are going to spend most of their time. And you've already seen some examples of similar kind of looking interfaces um, today. So here we've got uh, the data module code column, which... Um, you know, which is fundamental to data modules. That's how we identify our data modules. And then we've got the tech name and the info name. We've got the status, so we can see, you know, um, at what status that data module is at. Um, data modules are organized in here according to their standard numbering system. So I could drill in here and filter on the standard numbering system. And there are numerous ways to filter the data in here including uh, the status, so I could go to the status here, I could filter on the status, I could click on assigned to me, and that would filter the data to give me anything that's got my name in the author or reviewer column, so I like to think of that as my inbox. And numerous other filtering mechanisms, including some more advanced applicability filtering mechanisms, which Charles touched on earlier. You can see the tags down here that we've added to some data modules. Okay, so let's have a look at a data module. So, firstly, let's have a quick look at a descriptive data module. So this one is already checked out and it's assigned to me that you can see there. So all I need to do is come up to the author menu and click edit DM and this will open the data module in our integrated editing environment. Now, one of the things that makes our editing environment unique is uh, the fact that it's almost word-like in its operation. So again, we've tried to take away the complexity of having to learn XML or no XML um, when designing this. And essentially, you can use this much like a word processing tool to create your data modules. So as we look through, you can see it's nicely formatted. Uh, if we wanted to add another uh, step there, for example, another um, bullet, we just click enter uh, and we can add a new item. But we are working with XML underneath and we can prove that by opening the XML pane here. So this is all the XML underneath. Now this is read only, so we can't do any damage in here, but it updates as we update the document view. So it enables us to see what's kind of happening under the hood. If we want to, we can also do a PDF preview from here. So if I click the PDF preview button, that will give us an idea of what the printed output will, like, will look like. Some other features that we've got on the interface, if I come down to this one here, for example, we can see a couple of icons here. What I can do is drill into the record here. Now, as we said earlier, S1000D is largely based around the interreferencing of data modules to avoid duplication and maintaining that single point of truth. So, you know, it's important to know what references each data module and be able to keep record of what, you know, what is referencing what. So we've got a where, where used tab here where we can see what references this specific model, uh, module. We've got the graphics tab here so we can see what graphics are contained within that data module. We've got a history tab because it's important that we keep an audit log of what's happening to this data module as well. And as you can see, this one 
has quite a big history to it. We've got a notes as well, so any notes that the author wants to leave against this record, they can do. So you can see here that I've added a few notes previously. Um, and essentially, this comes from my authoring days when we used to run you know, Excel spreadsheets alongside the CSDB, um, which is not particularly efficient. So when we designed this, we decided to kind of integrate the note-taking ability. And attachments, if we've got attachments such as source data or engineering technical specifications or anything else that we might want to add here that's relevant to that specific data module. In addition to that, we also capture the review comments so when a data module goes into review uh, and it is rejected by the reviewer, any comments they've made in the data module will be captured here, including any responses from the author that's come back. So again, kind of an audit log of the conversations that's happened between the author and reviewer during that review period. Let's just have a quick look in here. So this is now a procedural data module as opposed to a descriptive module that we saw a moment ago. So we get these kind of template tables that are available to us at the top here. So every procedural module, you get the opportunity to list support equipment, cons uh, consumables, and spares. Uh, so these templates enable us to very, very easily add supplies, should we wish. As you can see, we've already got some support equipment and spares in here. But if we wanted to add a consumable, we would click this one and that gives us the relevant elements and attributes that we need to fill in. Here you can, previous, you can see some previous comments that have been left by reviewer and um, an author. So essentially when we put a data module into review, the reviewer opens the data module in exactly the same environment, but they only have the ability to leave comments. They cannot actually edit the data module, so it's locked to them other than the ability to leave comment. I want to add another step in here, for example. And if I wanted to add a graphic, I can just click the graphic button. The graphics that are available to me are listed. And I just click the button, insert graphic. And in it goes. All I need to do is add a title. So it enables the authoring process to concentrate on the technical content and not the authoring software they're using. Essentially, if you can use Word, you can use this and you can create S1000D content. So publishing, we've got all these data modules, but you know, what do we do with them? How do we create a coherent technical manual at the end? Well, Charles touched on this earlier and you know, Publishing in S1000D is done using publication modules. So if I go to the publishing page, in fact, I'm going to skip to this different tab where I've got a, a, one that I previously set up, but it's exactly the same. Um, so each one of these are publication modules. A publication module is a data module, but it's a data module that enable, uh, it's, it holds the structure that we desire for our final publication. So if I drag this one over, for example, and again, you saw Charles doing some of this earlier. I've created some structure here, so I might want this as my output. I may want these headings in my final publication. Then all I've done is I've come through and dragged and dropped data modules into those headings. And I can create any kind of structure here that I wish, and any kind of you know, subheadings and sub-subheadings. And then to create the publication, we would just do a right click, and I would go publish to PDF. But one thing that I did want to touch on as well, finally, was uh, it's a bit of a sneak preview. We haven't released this yet, but also under signal view here, we've got the ability to publish to uh, an HTML5 output. So currently, in the S1000D world, there is typically PDF or the far more advanced IETP, the Interactive Electronic Technical Publications or Technical Manuals. But there's very little in between. So what we've done is tried to kind of fill that gap to give, you, oh, sorry, to give you something kind of in between. So the output that comes from here is essentially just a folder. So if I go to my downloads, and this here is the downloaded package that comes when I publish to SignalView. 
And essentially what this is is an HTML5 website. So if I double click on index, this now opens that publication and I can navigate through here. And here is my data module in a nice, pretty, user-friendly user interface. Okay, so that is more or less it from me. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, the examples that you have given are uh, more, uh, mostly uh, physical products like bike or uh, some items that yeah. once they are produced, they are fixed. But in our world today, uh, I mean, even in Tesla cars, you can add functionality, you can have uh, Auto, autonomous driving added to it, added to the product uh, after its purchase. So uh, let's say I have a phone and uh, it has a screen lock feature and today I'm unlocking my phone with uh, adding uh, numbers, uh, pin, and then later if I uh, switch to uh, fingerprint scanning, some functionality breaks, breaks down and I have to uh, resolve this issue. So in this format, uh, I can't em uh, envision how uh, you can uh, talk about functionality pr uh, provided by, uh, by, a, by a product because it, it looks as if there is an underlying rigid hierarchy of elements uh, that form uh, your product. So could you, for example, use this uh, to, let's say, could you use uh, S1, the, uh, S1000D standard to write a manual for, let's say, PTC wind chill software? Good Would it question. be practical? So I, I, think you were, I think you were starting to get into the realms of where we would use applicability in data, and applicability is an advanced subject in S1000D, and Charles touched on it earlier. It's where we have the ability to have um, um, conditions uh, that our products are being uh, maintained in, for example, weather conditions or service bulletin conditions, and we can choose, you know, you use the example of a Tesla car, um, and, you know, the Tesla may have certain functions available on one model or to some customer, and not so much, or, or, or that those features aren't available to another customer, and that is where we could use applicability. In terms of software and S1000D, there is no reason why you couldn't do it. In fact, I have seen it done. I can think of one example of another software vendor has written all their software documentation in S1000D. Now, whether it's the best fit, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's modular. There's no reason why not. We can talk about how to do specific things in software in a procedural module, which buttons to click, you know, a description of what this function does in the software. And again, that modular aspect means that we can rearrange those building blocks in any way we like to create whatever kind of publication we like. So I think, yes, it could be done is the, is the short answer. I have one more question. It, uh, it does. We also have, <coughs> this is Charles. Um, we also, th there are different types of information structures and then you talked about a, a rigid structure. There's a lot of flexibility in the information types that you have. There are troubleshooting um, templates that allow you to do troubleshooting procedures. So to give you an idea, the 787 uh, Boeing aircraft uh, is all done in S1000D, and that includes all of the um, cockpit, which is basically software documentation. Um, so there's, there's a lot of flexibility. You also have a lot of flexibility in setting up your your structure. So if your structure requires um, being able to handle software documentation, you would have that as, as part of your, of your hierarchy. So it's a matter of how you tailor S1000D for your particular project. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Uh, the document that you have produced is on, only in English, but I suppose uh, for an international market, you could easily uh, adapt it 
in many different languages? The software product itself already supports multi, multi languages, so that is not a, not a problem. If you're talking about the content that we're looking at content, now, for yes, example, yes. That, you know, there, there would be a translation um, process to go through. No, I mean, uh, how how can one manage uh, a document that is simultaneous in different languages? Yeah, good. Charles, do you want to go for that one? Yeah. So we've got clients that are that are doing that. You you typically designate a particular language as what we refer to as the primary language. So you do all of your authoring initially in that primary language. And then when that content is done, um, you would send it for translation. Uh, and that is what would be referred to as a secondary uh, language. So the, any of the translations, so if we author, uh, say, in English, but then we translate to um, you know, Italian and French, everything would be authored in English, but then it would be translated to Italian and French. So you would put that content back into a CSDB that is particular for Italian or particular for French, the way you would manage that is if the English ever changed again, you would know that you have to re-translate uh, for Italian or French. So very possible it's, it's been done by several of our clients. Okay. Ki bu Winchell tarafından bir örnek verebiliriz bu konuda. Bizim S1'de dışında teknik dokümanlarını yönetmek isteyen firmaların da Winchill S1'de modülü dışında Winchill SIM dediğimiz Service Information Manager modülüyle çalıştığı durumlar da söz konusu. Onlar yine Arbortex kullanıyorlar. Dokümanı yine Winchill'de tutuyorlar. Bu Winchill sunumunda gördüğünüz aynı Information Structure ve Publication Structure'da gördüğünüz gibi Information structure aslında bir XML parçacıklarından oluşan bir havuz gibi düşünün. Her bir publication structure'da yayınladığınız bir kitap oluyor aslında. Burada siz o kitabı oluşturduktan sonra zaten o kitabı ilk oluştururken dil seçiyordu dikkat ederseniz. O onun orijinal dili oluyor. Sistem onun için zaten bir XML bundle zip olarak hazırlamış oluyor. Siz diyorsunuz ki işlem bittikten sonra Translation Manager dediğimiz bir arayüzü var Winchill'in. Orada dil paketi, hangi dil paketlerinde bunun yayınını yapmak istiyorsanız onlar için bir XML dosya bütünü çıkarıyorsunuz dışarı. Diyorsunuz ki bunu Fransızcası, Türkçesi, işte İtalyancasını da ben istiyorum. Bir zip dosyası olarak o XML dokümanlarını size veriyor. Siz alıyorsunuz onu, çeviri ofisine gönderiyorsunuz. Onlarla çalışan otokar var mesela burada o tarz çalışıyor tercüme ofisine gönderiyorlar. Onlar egzemel dokümanlarını açıyor çeviri ofisi. Tek alanında işte Türkçe olarak gördüğü tanımın işte İngilizce tek alanına İngilizce tanımını, İtalyancasına İtalyancayı. Bunu bitirdikten sonra tekrar zipleyip gönderiyor dokümanı. Winchill'e yüklediklerinde Winchill onu okuyor. Diyor ki işte bunun şu anda Fransızca dil paketi hazır yayınlamak ister misin? Siz onu seçip direkt Fransızca dil paketiyle yayınlıyorsunuz. Dokümanlarda herhangi bir değişiklik olduğu zaman da sadece değişen kısmını bu zip dosyasına atıyor. Dolayısıyla çeviri maliyetlerini de o anlamda optimize edebiliyorsunuz. I think you finished, right? Good, thank you. Finish? Finish. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ee, sunumların sonuna geldik. Sorularınız varsa alalım. Ee, epey katlandınız bugün. Çok teşekkür ederiz. Sabırla dinlediğiniz için. Ee, sorularınız yoksa e, herkes ayrı ayrı tekrar teşekkür ederek e, bugünü kapatabiliriz. E, biz bu sunumları yine dediğim gibi sizinle paylaşacağız. Sonrasında diğer çözümlerle ilgili bizimle iletişime geçmek isterseniz memnuniyetle e, organize ederiz. Çok teşekkürler. <gülüyor>